Hey everybody, Will Foley here, uh, part of the MSP uh, supercharged event. Uh, and we have a supercharged lineup of awesome guest speakers. Today's content, we're going to talk about RevOps at a growing sales org. Uh, so we brought some awesome uh, talent here to really share with you some of the best practices, learnings. Uh, I know I have plenty of failures to share as well, but I'm super excited to be part of this. Um, again, my name is Will Foley. I'll be the uh, moderator for today's panel. I'm the VP of Revenue Operations at Brazen, uh, and I'm super excited to first hand it off to Melody for her introduction. Thank you so much, Will. Um, thank you so much for uh, having me, having us. It's nice to meet you, everyone, virtually. Uh, my name is Melody Schwartz. I'm the VP of Enablement and Operations um, here at SPIF, uh, headquartered out of Los Angeles, California, and excited to be here. Awesome, Melody. I'm excited as well to have you. Benjamin, sharing my same last name, lost long cousins, brothers, baby? Potentially. I don't know. Um, yeah, well... Thanks, Will. Uh, thanks for having us on Modern Sales Pros. My name is Ben Foley. Uh, I'm the Chief of Staff at Flock Safety, which uh, is a pretty nebulous title. However, I uh, had the opportunity to uh, run our RevOps and focus a lot on our uh, data and analytics and strategy for our revenue team here. Uh, based out of Indianapolis, uh, excited to be on today. Awesome, Ben. I'm excited as well. Awesome. Last but not least, Nathan. Thanks, Will. That leaves me. Uh, yeah, really excited to be here. Nate Fallon, uh, head of our business systems uh, operations team at Ramp. Um, so work really closely with our go-to-market leads from the entire funnel lead to, to cash and manage our Salesforce administrative team and sales ops uh, admin team. Awesome. Thank you for that. Excited to have you. Um, you know, growing RevOps um, and growing sales organizations um, certainly can benefit from the RevOps function. And it means a lot of different things in a lot of different places, but one of the core pillars is really, uh, from my observations with RevOps, is leveraging data and analytics to drive sales performance. And so some of the things that I know I look at constantly are metrics all day, every day. But what makes metrics amazing is pulling insights out that drive behavioral changes. So um, I'm first going to kick it off to Ben to get your thoughts on how you leverage data and analytics to really drive sales performance within your organization. Yeah, um, obviously a big topic uh, for everybody here. Uh, and, you know, one of the things we think about a lot when we're thinking about our go to market data and analytics and also we at Flock have a majority of our sales folks are in the field, uh, not inside. And so um, some of the data that we are able to gather for how they are, you know, obviously opening pipeline, moving pipeline and closing pipeline um, is not as uh, always tied to Salesforce or data and analytics. So um, we try to make it as simple as possible and really focus on what we call our golden metrics, right? Like what are the key output metrics that drive the key behaviors we want? our reps to be producing that then ultimately, you know, generates the right, the, the revenue um, and efficiency that we want for, for our teams. Um, Cause I think sometimes in RevOps you can do um, paralysis analysis and, and go too deep into the weeds sometimes, which is really great for RevOps to really understand the market dynamics. But then when you actually go deliver that to the sales team, it's kind of hard for them sometimes to, to digest that and then take action on it. And so we really try to simplify to key generally three to four golden metrics that we're trying to drive our sales reps um, and our managers on week over week. Um, and then we track those within a single dashboard that everybody is leveraging. Um, and it's again, really focusing on that simplicity of that dashboard. So everybody actually uses it, adopts it and focuses on it. Um, I think some of the times when everybody has their own dashboards, no one has a, a key dashboard, right? And so I think simplicity, figuring out what those golden metrics are tied to those OKRs and really driving those home week over week and making sure that everybody has visibility onto that. So that's how we kind of operationalize some of that. That's awesome. I, I know, Ben, I've been in conversations where it goes something along the lines of, but what about this metric? And what about this metric? And what about this metric? 
And I'm curious, because you uh, bring up those key metrics, how do you work with your stakeholders to really dive into what they are when you have so many to evaluate? How do you pick those, choose those with those key stakeholders? Yeah, it's just like anything in life. There's always a negotiation on, you know, what they, with the sales leaders, right? With the marketing leaders, ultimately what our CRO wants to, wants to be focused on and ultimately what is actually the root cause of what we're trying to drive, right? And so like, we think a lot about root cause analysis and like what truly is driving the outputs we want. Um, Because some, I think a lot of things can be vanity metrics, right? Where um, people, it looks really good. They're going up into the right, but is it actually driving the behavior that, that you want? And so it's nothing super complex, right? It's like, what are the key OKRs that our business is looking at? Are we trying to drive certain new product adoption? Are we trying to drive pipeline creation? Are we trying to break into new markets and really building down what are the key le- leading indicators? Like, is it activity? Is it calls? Is it X, Y, Z? And drilling into those, but then keeping it, um, you know, to scoping that that amount of those down a little bit. So that's kind of how we think about it is, is not overthinking it, I guess. Yeah, I know RevOps leaders love to think. Love, love, love. Got <laughs> so much to think about, uh, but it's really that simplicity that, that drives change. Um, awesome. Thank you. Um, I know in our pre-chat for this event, Nathan, you brought up dashboard fatigue. Ben, you called it analysis paralysis. I'm curious, Nathan, what are your thoughts? How do you prevent those dashboards from just fatiguing your audience? Yeah, that, that answer really resonated with me. I think analysis paralysis or just overthinking. You know, we have a lot of smart people at at, uh, at Ramp and we have a lot of dashboards and and I found out that, you know, shadowing a few reps, everyone actually does create their own dashboards often. So early on, at, at, at companies like to shadow and see what, what metrics people care about, how they like to ingest data, um, and try to meet them where they are. So <clears throat> publishing just a wall of dashboards with metrics going up into the left, up into the right, doesn't really drive behavior. And, and we found that people don't really, uh, interpreting dashboards is, is oftentimes a lot easier for someone in RevOps or in, in operations, and not as easy for you know, a new seller, for instance. So having a clear call to action um, behind each dashboard or even each element on a dashboard of, of what we're trying to drive or why, why this metric is important and understand the context is one thing that we've really tried to drive home. Some kind of practical examples there are optimizing Salesforce homepages so that they actually have the data right in front of them, um, using something like a, a Troops or a Slack connector to pipe the data into the sales channels that people are actually actively communicating on. So if we're trying to drive a behavior, uh, we try to, to first analyze, like, analyze what uh, what tools folks are using and how they could best ingest uh, information uh, around optimizing those metrics. Curious, Ben, too, some of you mentioned activity outputs. Um, some of the activities or, or behaviors you look to drive uh, um, from these metrics or, or look to change from uh, from the analysis. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I love your, like, optimizing, like, what are the practical um you know, activities or we call them AIs, like action items that we can take on on this data, because without that, you know, you're just having a good conversation. Um, uh, So like one of the things that we use, one of the like platforms, I will, to deliver this information is our leaders send end of week recaps that like have the exact same metrics across all teams that then go to the dashboard, right? So like, like I said, a lot of our reps are in the field, so they're not in Slack, they're not in Salesforce often. And so they do digest a lot of information via email. And we found that was the best way to actually interact them. But some of the things that we're looking at, Nathan, are ICB accounts engaged per week, right? Like we know that, how many accounts are we getting after? TAM accounts engaged per week. And then something that we call here, we talk a lot about flywheel or full city coverage. And so we actually have a small list of target accounts that we're trying to um, incorporate a full city coverage with. And so we're also tracking that as the like main leading indicators for activity. We personally don't track, you know, phone calls, email sends necessarily at that level. Um, we do on the rev op side and, and we want to make sure we're generating pipeline, but ultimately like the output metrics are what we want to drive uh, versus the input metrics. Awesome. I love that. And I know we, uh, some of those metrics or framework that I found helpful is separating out the skill metrics, like the conversion rates and win rates mm-hmm. that you can really see are different amongst top performing reps or reps that are very tenured versus the will metrics that, that I think a lot 
a lot of companies focus on, which is just number of emails, number of dials, number of opportunities generated. Um, so yeah, I, I found it helpful to kind of separate out those those dashboards to, to contextualize what what folks are looking at. Awesome, I I, I totally agree. And and Ben, you brought up um, kind of weekly cadences, and I know Melody, we we chatted earlier about you know how important operating rhythms are across your organization because. You know, I know that, you know, when data is not looking good, the first thing is panic. Um, yeah. We got to change everything. Um, but sometimes, you know, having that clear operating rhythm certainly yeah. helps in those scenarios. I'm curious how, how those have helped you uh, in your RevOps um, career. Yeah, you know, having a, a solid operating rhythm is everything. And I do think it's like the antidote to analysis paralysis. If you can guide your audience to look at certain sets of data throughout thir certain times of the week, the month or the quarter, I think you're better for it. Um, the way that I think about data is in four buckets. It's the first one is activity. So Nathan, you, you nodded to this, um, you know, pipeline, Ben, you nodded to this as well. Um, your forecast reports, but then also I think the fourth one that has been huge for us is um, kind of a folder that we keep on the sales ops side, which is, um, just like an audit or administrative report. So, you know, this these are all like the five to 10 things, you know, that we check on a Friday afternoon just to make sure that the business is healthy. Um, so this is everything from, you know, example of that would be like, you know, the number of contact, contact roles or contacts associated to an opportunity. Um, going into a forecast meeting, that's a, a data point that you can share with your leadership team um, to, you know, support accuracy going into that Monday meeting. Um, as far as like an operating cadence goes, you know, what we do here at SPIF is on Monday morning, we have our um, sales manager forecast meeting. Tuesday, we've got an executive roll up. Um, Thursday and Friday are team meetings, one on ones, forecast meetings. Um, and then we do the same thing every week throughout every month. And then at the second month of the quarter, we start to look ahead. So um, if you can guide your audience as to what data to look at and when, um, it's really on us to catch any sort of anomalies heading into that meeting, but you'll you'll be better for it too. Awesome. I, yeah. you know, being a RevOps leader myself, that resonates. But yeah. I know that sometimes key stakeholders, maybe in other departments, unnamed in this call, sales, marketing, or CS, um, may not see that the same way. And I'm curious, Melody, how you work with those key stakeholders to say, hey, these operating cadences matter. Yeah. This is why you should really care about it. You know, I think that the message that you need to sell and rally around internally is that even though we're different departments and different teams, there's one customer journey. And so like, you know, bring everybody into the operating cadence. You know, you're, you're you know, one team, one dream. I know we're kind of overhearing that, but it really is true. So I'll give you an example of that. So monthly, um, we have an operations call. Actually, twice a month, we have an operations call where, um, you know, we walk through what's prioritized, what's getting built. And in some cases, it's, uh, you know, stakeholder sign off. Um, the alternative weeks are pipeline reviews where um, our director of marketing operations will, you know, provide an update as to, you know, the health of our pipeline. And also, you know, sales leaders would also give their feedback. So, you know, bring them into the fold. It's it's at the end of the day, it's your responsibility to, to be the glue of the organization. And you have to, you know, you have to remember that through all of the, the thick and thin that you kind of um, go through internally. Awesome. Yeah, I, I feel like that is a key component of really helping drive behavioral changes is buy-in across your key stakeholders. So thank you for, for those tips. So we've been talking about, you know, monitoring our data, really understanding how we're performing against plans. Uh, and what's most important sometimes, uh, especially I feel like in this really unprecedented economic time, is having a good plan. Uh, and RevOps plays a key component in really implementing a effective and efficient revenue management plan for growth. And so Ben, I'm, I'm curious, like from your perspective, you know, how do you think about implementing those effective plans? What does that success look like for you? 
It, it, always changing, always iterating, right? Um, I don't think you'd be uh, a, a RevOps leader if you didn't like uh, iterating on and continually improving. I think there's a couple components that we think about. Like we have a uh, very similar to Melody. We have um, similar weekly, monthly, quarterly cadences that we've rolled out that kind of stack against different um, pieces of our, of our customer chain, right? Um, and so I think that having that and having everybody aligned on like, here's when you need to do X and like, here's when you need to do Y so that everybody's aligned, I think is like, to me, the, the base before you do any planning. Because if you just do planning and it's ad hoc every quarter, it's really, it causes a lot of friction and ultimately doesn't give you the outcome you're looking for. So I think there there's, for us, at least my role, that's a like key piece of, key piece of what I'm doing. Um, and then ultimately, when we think about the data side, we build both like a, a demand waterfall model and then a bottoms up model to give our sales and marketing leaders a good insight into like, okay, here's what we think you all can go accomplish next quarter this year. Um, and really having that open dialogue versus just shipping it out, right? Like we do have everybody from those key stakeholders come on the same call and walk through that. And I think that is a key piece. Um, ultimately, you know, the CEO, the CRO is going to set some of those numbers at the top level, but I think it's RevOps's job is to simplify the data for the leaders and make sure they understand how they can be successful. Because if the VP of sales doesn't know that, the director of sales definitely isn't going to know that. And then your AE in the field is not going to feel super confident that they're going to be able to go achieve their goal. And so I think RevOps really sits at the middle of, of kind of obviously pulling together the data, building the models, but then articulating what that vision is and how they can go be successful uh, uh, stacked against that uh, model. Uh, so that's kind of how we think about it. There's obviously specific kind of practical ways. We do weekly business reviews that are focused on key themes like expansion, new products, implementation that we bring stakeholders from all departments in and then have readout metrics and initiatives that are stacked against those. It's a great way to get everybody involved in, you know, in an async way um, every week. And then, you know, typical OKRs, things like that, that we do on a quarterly basis. Super helpful, um, Ben. And, and I know in our warm-up call, we talked about historical trends versus day-to-day -day feedback, as you called it. Um, and I'm so curious how you balance the two. You know, that that is like the bane of my existence is you look at historical data and project it out and say, this is what we should anticipate or how much of the we'll call it anecdotal or gut or things that are not currently being measured, how much does that fall into your, your plans and how do you find that balance? Yeah, if I had an answer for that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Me too. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, because like also, you, you brought up, right? Unprecedented times. I think it, everybody on this call is probably dealing with something this quarter that they probably have never dealt with before, or at least over the last you know three to four quarters have dealt with a quarter that doesn't feel like anything that's gone in the past before them. And so when you're building all your growth plans based on only historical data, like then you have a quarter like that, it's like you got to reinvent the model really, right? And so I think it's always, you know, not having... Um, you know, having humility to be like, oh, I got to go recreate this whole thing. Like, it, it's not right. We need to like update the inputs. We need to make sure we're we're looking at things uh, futuristically in a way that uh, makes sense based on current data that we're getting. Um, but I always think like the model is kind of what informs, but that like quanti qualitative data that you're hearing from the field should definitely give you a good sense of how to hone, hone the model. Um, and I think we're I have gone wrong in the past is like focusing too much on the data and not just going to talk to a sales rep and being like, what are, what are you hearing? What's going on? What's the feedback? What would this do? Um, because ultimately there are the people that are in the field talking to the customers and that's what we're doing here. The goal is to like drive revenue and drive outcomes for our customers. And so I think sometimes when you get too into the weeds, too into the model, um, you lose sight of that. Um, so I, I don't have an answer, but that's kind of how I think about it. I don't have an answer either, Ben. So we're in the same boat. Maybe, Melody, you have an answer because I know you're constantly working from a top down perspective and a bottoms up. How do you appease the board or future investors while also rooting in what is reality and accomplishable? Yeah, you know, um, I'll, uh, I'll double click on Ben's um, uh, kind of thought here around we're all kind of navigating 
um, not only as revenue operations leaders, but also as business leaders and entrepreneurs. And I think, you know, what I know to be true is that we will get, you know, a top down model. Um, when we get that top down model, we'll also kind of create the same data points bottom up, backed by survey feedback, backed by, um, you know, anecdotal implementation or anecdotal feedback from the field. Um, and then we'll arrive at a place with like, you know, what do I know to be true? So a really good example of that is when we were looking at our historical ramp data. Um, I joined SPIF about a year ago. So prior to my, um, you know, joining SPIF, we didn't really have an onboarding program that was um, as effective, I think, as we all um, know it could have been. So when I look at our ramp data, I had to shave it down with, you know, certain reps, certain territories based on certain um, experiences, um, and that informs our ramp assumption moving forward. Um, so you really have to look at that data and ask yourself, what do I know to be true? And what are the data points that I know are reliable that I can make some assumptions on? Now, that's a heavy assumption because I think we're all dealing with some like historical data that we that maybe doesn't pass the gut check, but you really have to be comfortable making that call. Um, the other thing I think is so important for implementing a revenue plan is having really, really strong programs and rallying around that. So when you're looking at the data, you have to ask yourself, what do I know to be true? And ultimately, it's an activity metric, it's a pipeline or conversion metric, or it's a forecast accuracy metric. And shaving down that conversation to really figure out, okay, well, I'm now focused on, you know, top of funnel leads that convert from my self-sourced, like direct sales team. Like then you land on a creative place to um, start to implement what better looks like. So it's a it's a happy kind of marriage of a lot of different thoughts that ultimately yield to, I think, a very successful outcome. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, it is that constant, you know, when you think about really um, your your focus on what is true or what can you rely on, and that's change. Change yeah. will will happen consistently. And and Nathan, one of the things that you brought up, which I think is so important, is how the perfect bottoms up, the perfect top down model will change. Um, and it's those fast feedback loops that you are talking about that resonated so well with me. And I'm curious, how do you work with those? What do those look like? And, and how do you take these beautiful plans that work in Excel, but then actually deliver on them um, in real life? Yeah. Yeah. So Melody, I, I love what you said about assumptions and, and that that one's big uh, for us is spelling out and being really explicit about here's where the model came from. Here's what we're assuming is going to happen. We assume reps are going to be as efficient. We assume this attrition rate. Um, and then we measure against that. So instead of just noting the assumptions at the beginning of the quarter, or beginning of the half, <clears throat> we say, all right, we thought this new product was going to bring us this much. We have a gap because it's brought us this much or it's, it's overperformed. So measuring those assumptions and, and how we're trending to those will help the model improve in the future quarters or hopefully we'll, we'll improve the model of future quarters. Uh, it's always an art and a science. I think if it was a, a strict science, then we wouldn't have jobs necessarily. It would be, it would be all automated. So um, it's, it's a good thing to some extent. The other, the other side of that is, Ben, what you said is just talking to a seller every once in a while. Um, coming from the systems world, we, all of our stakeholders, ourselves included, love restructured data, sometimes to a fault. So uh, what what I've implemented at a few companies is really just adding in your own words why we win a deal and why we lose a deal. And what this does is just gives us real direct feedback and rather than like really structured data. Some people just click through, don't add the right things. We don't have a pick list value that 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 fits into the the category. So getting that fast feedback from our sellers in the field of why we're winning, why we're losing, and then using that to kind of inform or at least um, uh, add some confidence to our to our models is, is super important. Yeah, I those assumptions and tracking and understanding were you on target with those assumptions? Did they change? How did they change? Really, is a feedback loop to RevOps to build that better model, and that I feel like is something that I can work on tremendously. So, thank you for for that reminder. Um, and and when I think about 
our conversation so far. We've kind of talked about measuring, providing good information and keeping it focused. How do we create this beautiful model that we're tracking against? But ultimately, we skipped over a really important piece of this whole pie, which is we need data. We need an infrastructure. We need the information in order to do any of this. Um, and Nathan, one of the things that you brought up that really resonated with me is that, you know, everybody's got tools. Not everybody has owners of those tools. And you were talking amazing best practices around ownership and how important that is to building a successful infrastructure for RevOps. I was hoping you could share a little more with the audience here today. Yeah, I'd love to. So, so I think, as, as we all know, we probably get a, a 10 emails a day with a new vendor for a new tool for the RevOps world. And there's tons of feature redundancy. Every, everyone's kind of colliding on a lot of the same feature sets. So, so what I found is, is almost more important than selecting the right tool is selecting the owner and, and who's responsible for the full implementation, enablement, uh, Melody, which would probably be live in your world, as well as the ongoing maintenance and, and testing our, our usability with our stakeholders changing sometimes like really small, uh, simple settings will we'll save a couple of reps an hour a day or something to that effect. So, so really ongoing ownership of the tools that are used each day and making sure that that department feels like they're part of the team. So em embedding in our, we have uh, our business systems analysts here um, work with uh, a part of our funnel. So we have a top of funnel and they have weekly sprints and weekly cadences with that team to really uh, align themselves with their goals and prioritize um, the tooling and process that, that is most important to drive revenue. So all of our projects should help one of our revenue metrics in, in that sense. Uh, and feeling embedded really is is a core kind of part of our one team mindset uh, at Ramp. I don't know if any of you have had this experience. It certainly happened to me. I've walked into a room and feel like I've missed seven or 10 meetings uh, and decisions have been made and I'm the tool owner in that situation. And why wasn't I informed of this? And Nathan, you bring up just an amazing point that involving those owners into the process and being part of it really changes that, that dynamic because it takes it from the name next to the tool to true ownership. They're part of it. So that's something I know, Melody, you doubled down on as well, how important ownership is. How do you do that within your org? Yeah. So I'll also share that something that I have fiercely interviewed for throughout my entire career is someone that is a doer. Like our CRO also likes to say, you know, we like Ivy League street fighters. <laughs> and so I think it's really important that you hire the right person um, that has a track record for success, that can think on their feet, that shows examples of teamwork. Um, I think, you know, that's a little captain obvious, but it's really difficult to find. Um, you know, the next piece of um, working together, establishing ownership is, um, establishing what operations leader is responsible for, what technology they own, but most importantly, um, you know, something that I keep is examples of how we work together. Uh, so, for example, if you're going to change a setting here, the expectations that is you need to talk to customer operations to make sure that gets pulled through the organization. So, I think more and more so, the infrastructure becomes something on repeat, but the expectation of how you work together is something to um, evangelize. And look, you know, if it saves time or gives you greater insights on the customer, double down on it. But otherwise, you know, put your skeptic hat on because likely um, it may not meet your needs long term. That is, um, that resonates so much. Um, a lot of times requests come in and someone says, hey, this would be neat, or it would be interesting. And those are just trigger words for me, like build a use case or a business value on on why I want that, uh, or what this will do to the bottom line. And uh, that makes uh, total sense. And Melody, I'm, I'm curious, because you, you um, talked about hiring the right people. That solves so many good uh, challenges, uh, prevents problems. 
how do you find those doers, right? An interview is, is like a screen. You have a conversation. You don't get to see the doing. Yeah. How do you evaluate that? What are, what are your tips and tricks to, to pull that out in the interviewing process? Um, I probe into examples. Um, so I'll say, you know, uh, actually the question that I lead with in almost every interview. So if you're listening to this, just, you know, act like you don't know. <laughs> so anyways, uh, the question that I lead with in every interview is what's the most difficult project you've ever worked on? And so that really, A, gives me a frame of reference as to what I'm working with. Um, then I start to diagnose questions. How did you find that problem? Who did you work with? How did you diagnose it? How did you come up with a solution? Um, and so you start to like unpack how they approach or how the candidate will approach solving a problem. And, you know, what you're listening for is like, did I go rogue and, you know, implement some sort of a hack that I'm now trying to, you know, button up in the conversation? I, I say that respectfully, but you do find that. Um, or is this someone that really is a holistic thinker that can roll their sleeves up and say, hey, you know, we have this problem. I got us started to 50 percent, but then I needed to engage an, a, you know, an AE or a direct seller to go from 50 to 80. And then I put it on the roadmap because it solved a problem. Um, any flavor of that is a good thing. Um, even if at the very basic level, if someone understands I do X to get Y and I have control over that outcome, you're, you're in good company. So I really am doubling down on examples and teamwork and just making sure that person thinks about problems holistically. That's awesome. Really assessing how curious they are, how, how intuitive are they from a problem to a solution, but also being able to really understand how everything within a business is, is connected. Um, yeah. that, that makes uh, total sense to, to me. Um, and I'm curious from, from Ben's perspective, um, you really talked about uh, in our uh, pre-meeting charters, but also how important it was to organize RevOps to mirror what your organization's needs are. How do you come up with that? How do you work with your team to really support your uh, your key stakeholders with the RevOps team? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. and. Um... I love Melody and you will talking about hiring. I think it's just, it's an under th uh, thought about skill, I think. Uh, so for me, like just background, I have no background in RevOps uh, prior to this role. Um, and then, uh, but I spent the first three years of my career in investment banking. So it's just like, I just had the mind that like, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to build the data. But like, so I had the, probably the benefit of not having historical baggage on like how RevOps should be looked. I looked at the LinkedIn post that said X, Y, Z, and, you know, built my model based on, you know, a LinkedIn RevOps leader. Um, n nothing wrong with that, but like, I just do think that thinking about things from a beginner's mindset is always going to be key. And where mm -hmm. like our world, like I came into a company that was, um, you know, we're growing really well and like had a tech stack that was well low uh, below what I was doing at a company that was way smaller. Right. And they just didn't have a lot of tech. That wasn't something that they invested in um, because of how we sell. Like we're in the market. We didn't have gone like because they don't they don't have virtual calls. So like, you know, it's like, it was kind of crazy to think about like all these sales leaders that like, oh, go into Gong, get this analysis, love Gong. But like, that just wasn't, that just wasn't the world that we lived in. And so really thinking about it from first principles and saying like, okay, what are our objectives? How do we then, what's the strategy to go define those objectives and then what are the tactics? And I think that's really key when I look at any of our problems. So I do think that it's important to understand what the needs of the business are versus like what you think uh it should be um and so like i think I, I forget who said it but we had somebody on our sales kickoff come on and, and speak oh adam blitzer who's the ceo of datadog came on to our uh, sales kickoff and he said like i hire for people that bring experience not playbooks and i was like that that's just like an interesting way to think about it right because if somebody's bringing a playbook from x company to y company it might not work and like so they need to be humble enough to be like okay my playbook from here doesn't work here um, I think those playbooks are valuable, but they often can try to fit, you know, uh, a square peg through a round hole um, and then ultimately doesn't get the outcome. So I think just having the humility to to kind of morph what you think it should look like um, based on the organization. It's not an easy thing to do and not something that we've nailed either, but um, it's something that I try to think about. 
I love your your beginner mindset um, comment because I feel like you know in tech startups you are solving a new problem or not a new problem your solution is new to solving a problem and so who has the experience solving it if we're entrepreneurs the answer is nobody so no one has the experience solving this specific problem but what we're trying to figure out especially from a talent perspective and then from a rev ops perspective is what could solve that problem and how well are you at failing learning and growing from it uh it's i feel like this makes so much sense that um you know playbooks don't work it's experience uh and it's problem solving experience that leads to success yeah and to like melody's point like even when the interview process but like how can you get to the root cause find what the root causes are then apply a solution to those root causes and then go implement those like you can look at any problem from that same framework, right? And I think just bringing that to RevOps is, is really important. And that's the experience. And that's what I think hiring for can be really fun in RevOps because like, yeah, it's really great to have somebody maybe that has XYZ years of sales ops or RevOps or systems experience. Definitely for like Nathan's team, you probably want somebody that's like knows what Salesforce is to hire a Salesforce developer. But like, I think on, when some of the strategy and analytics side, we look for like kind of those athletes that can come in and like, just solve problems um, versus like know a specific set of how to do something. And so that's kind of how we think about it. And I think that's, that's just a way that we've been able to leverage uh, some of our team in, in unique ways. Awesome. I, I, I love that. And, you know, I feel like one of the greatest assets to a RevOps organization is their sales team, is their marketing team, is their customer success team. And, sometimes I wish, hey, you know, if RevOps could do it all, it, you know, the world would be a better place. But that's just a super biased opinion. But at the end of the day, you know, what I've learned is that if I teach the sales team or the customer success team or the marketing team and empower them with how processes help them, with how tools and data help them, and simplify it to what they need to know, things start working a lot better, especially you know with forecast calls when people walk in and they're just buttoned up, you can feel the room excitement, regardless of if we're forecasting good or bad, but you know that there's trust behind it and that is just an amazing place to, to be. And, and Ben, you know, you mentioned that simpler is better. How do you really empower your teams to really work on the right processes, to use the tools that you've given them or the data that, that you have provided so that they can do their job, which we're all reliant on as a RevOps team? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's too different than the kind of what we talked about at the top where it's like, what are those key metrics that like, solved 80% of the problem, right? We've all heard the 80-20 analysis, right? Like, but there really are probably like 20% of things that like really matter and the other 80% like is like at the margins matter. And so like, I think it all starts with that like upfront, like doing the real work to like define that and then putting that in front of everybody to, to on a weekly, whatever your cadence is that makes sense for your business. But like, if you align on something for OKRs and then never talk about it again, it's not very valuable. Like you gotta just continue to reinforce why it's valuable and why it's important. And then helping the sales leaders be like, hey, let's let's actually like promote and, and share the success of somebody who's doing what we're trying to do well. Um, that's what we try to do every week, just highlight somebody that's hitting the metrics that we are trying to enforce with the team so that everybody feels like, okay, like that person's doing well. How do we start engaging and, and doing um, and seeing what like a peer is doing well? So I think it's just defining the things really clearly up front, making them simple, and then ensuring everybody has it in front of their face as, as consistently as possible. So I love that. Consistency, use the carrot put the great example up on the board. People will naturally want to uh, go towards that. Um, Melody, you brought up a great point earlier about how important surveys are. Um, yeah. Just reaching out, getting people's feedback, just letting people know you care. I'm curious, how do you use surveys and other tools to really empower your teams? Yeah, you know, we want to 
solve the problems that the organization needs and also that the sellers have as well. So I'll, I'll give you some examples. Um, once a month, uh, my team has put out a content request survey. So what is like the training content, content that you want to see more of? Um, after an all hands or after an enablement session, I always send out a survey to get a rough like uh, CSAT. Um, did we cover the items that are valuable to you as a seller? Um, what did you want to see more of? What did you want to see less of? Um, and then also being able to uh, turn that around very quickly. Um, so in the next enablement session or the next all hands, show that you're taking the feedback um, to ensure that your sellers and your internal audience knows that um, you're doing everything you can to support them. Um, the one thing I'll also say in, in, in my career is I've always had this like last mile mentality, which is like you can have all this data, you can do all this planning, you can put together the most beautiful documentation and training decks. But if it doesn't land with your audience, it 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 will feel like it's all for nothing. That doesn't mean it is, <laughs> but it will feel like that. And so, um, you know, for me, I really, I get surveys from the team, but I really just think it's so important to um, be informed and be smart and be on your game across the revenue operations team. But most importantly, you get the adoption and you get the engagement when you have fun. Um, it's time and time again. And so send out a survey, make sure it's fun. I send out a monthly newsletter with just like, here are all the things you need to know. I make fun of myself. We roast some people. It's a good time. So just don't forget that that's an, a, a tool in your arsenal in addition to surveys is fun. People aren't tools. Uh, they are people. Uh, are yeah, that is uh, something that is just refreshing to be reminded of. So thank you, Melody. Um, Nathan, I know when we talked about this earlier, you brought up um, department champions, huge advocate of utilizing champions to really drive and empower departments. How do you use them uh, within your organization? Yeah, a uh, big plus one to what, what Melly said is is really having fun and, and understanding our stakeholders. I think I alluded to it a bit earlier on is is just having that face time, especially in a remote world with with the sales ICs and different department individual contrib contributors that we support. So the way we do it is we have these office hours or jam sessions with teams where anybody can attend. They're totally optional, but it gives the space and time just to say, hey, this is working or this isn't working in a in a non structured way. We also have our our kind of sprint meetings with our go-to-market leaders weekly, where sometimes we have a packed agenda, other times we don't have an agenda, and we we think of things kind of on the fly in that meeting that that came up that we needed to discuss. So having that that set aside time is is really key to understanding the pain points and and alleviating those. Um, how I empower the internal team is is I really love stretch projects. I think. Uh, getting somebody finding that right hire and, and allowing them to take on a, an additional work or new stretch projects in the Rev, RevOps landscape is super important to, to give us more creative ideas to how we could uh, improve our pipeline or improve efficiency internally. So it's a, and often that the passion for that project often spills over into to other work and day-to-day -day tasks. So it's one thing that, that I like to encourage. Um, yeah. So, so, and then Thirdly, I guess we use Lessonly for, for the training and encourage all of our team members to go through the Lessonly as if they are a seller to, to really follow that click path and understand our, our, um, uh, the day-to-day -day of a seller. Nathan, you bring up an amazing point. Um, I want to dive in a little deeper. You encourage your RevOps teams to take sales training. I've always advocated for that. Why? What are what benefits are you getting from your team being involved in those um, in those trainings? Yeah, the, the benefits are really just understanding what they have to do and what's actually broken. Sometimes, you know, squeaky wheel, you get someone that says, hey, this is broken. Um, gets the grease, so to speak, if, if someone's making a lot of noise. But our team really knows what can change quickly, what are low um, scope changes on the systems end or a quick process that can be put into place within a matter of days or, or weeks that can really improve the output of uh, the seller. So uh, what they get from it is is really empathizing with sellers, not having to ask to review documentation for the sales process when a new, when a new question comes up about something that's broken um, and being able to speak the same common language as the sellers.
Awesome. I know I've been an advocate for that. And one of the best trainings I've ever had personally is how to do discovery and applying discovery skills to internal projects. What is the problem you're having? Tell me more. What is your desire outcome? And that helps me really understand how big is this problem? Should I tackle it as a RevOps leader? And it allows me to really just understand what's going on. So huge fan of that, Nathan. Thanks for sharing that with me. So um, 45 minutes in so quick. Um, I always am in disbelief at how fast these go. But with that said, we're going to wrap up with final thoughts. And I'm going to first hand it off to Melody. Yeah. Man, this uh, flew by. What a great discussion. Thank you so much, Will. Um, and then Ben and Nathan as well. I'm sure we'll do a formal wrap up, but um, I've learned so much. Um, you know, just some final thoughts. Think outside the box. Be willing to think on your feet. Make sure you're always solving problems. But I also think, you know, our, our jobs vary from week to week, day to day, quarter to quarter. Um, just make sure you're taking care of yourself, um, that you're bringing your best self to work, that you are, um, you know, finding that time to prepare, to gather all of the data that you need to, um, you know, show up like the rock stars that you are day in and day out. So, you know, uh, from the past 45 minutes, you've learned a ton. We got this. Make sure to take care of yourself, too. Thank you for those kind words, Melody. Ben. Yeah, it's hard to hard to follow up with that. Uh, I'll, I'll double click on um, take care of yourself. It's uh, if, you, if you don't do that, it's hard to hard to deliver in your job or for the people that uh, you care about. But yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, you know, coming into this, it's been a great opportunity to learn from Nathan, Melody, and Will. Uh, so I, I would say just keep doing that. Like if you're on this call, like to me, like curiosity is like the key leverage in all careers. And if you are just deeply curious about everything, like you're going to figure it out and you're going to be able to drive value for your organization. And I think that's just um, something that I always focus on for myself and for the people that I hire and try to really um, instill that in my team. So that's just the keep it simple and stay curious about everything um, and just know that no one has figured it out, uh, especially now in the world that we're living in. Um, we're all we're all kind of uh, learning this every day, uh, but each day you'll you'll learn more um, and, and get better and, and have more confidence. So that's my uh, my last remarks. Thank you, Ben. Nathan. Yeah, yeah. So I love the the note about curiosity, Ben. I think that's that's really key to the role and a shameless plug to, to modern sales pros. And that email chain has been super helpful because sometimes it seems like you're solving a new problem. You ask the community and uh, just really grateful for the opportunity to talk to folks in this call and thought leaders in the space and have easy access through, through that group. Um, Cause oftentimes, you know, you can, you can build kind of blindly, but, but other folks have solved the same issue in the past. So, so making sure they're using the resources that are available today is, is super key. Uh, what I think is super important is, is RevOps is a relatively new space. Uh, product development has been in the world for, for a bit longer. So treating RevOps like a product is, is one way I really like to structure teams and saying we have to do customer support. We're going to build new product features. Um, we're going to make the sale or enable our new processes without uh, uh, within our sales teams or, or different go-to-market teams. So really treating it like a product, although you're using a bunch of different vendors, uh, looking at it holistically and understanding how to grow that, that revenue engine. Awesome. Love the product analogy. Um, I certainly use that within my team as well, and it resonates so uh, easily in, in the RevOps world. Um, thank you, Melody, Ben, Nathan, the MSP team, as well as the community. This has been awesome. My final thoughts is with RevOps, have fun doing it. We're all just trying to solve problems, learn, be curious, and have fun. Thank you all. All right. Thanks.